Welcome back to the fourth episode of the Clear Thought Politics podcast, where we critically analyze American politics and culture through the lens of skepticism and reason. Although you might be a conservative and I'm obviously a liberal, I hope that by now I've established a couple things in your mind. One, that I don't seem totally irrational to you, and two, that I'm at least not a complete idiot. I leave these two judgments to your fair-mindedness. But this podcast is about changing your view on Trump. So this is the episode where I'm going to start to say things that you're going to find controversial. What I ask is that you be patient with me and try to take me at my exact words. In return, I promise I'm not going to run down a list of common liberal talking points, and I'm not going to bother comparing the policies of the Democratic nominee to Trump. We are never going to agree on those things. I'm going to offer you some critiques of a man, not a politician. And if I can get you to at least consider these critiques, I think that would be a big credit to your ability to consider other perspectives on a very emotionally charged subject. So here it is. Here's the thousand foot view of my problem with Donald Trump and why I made this podcast. This is not a comprehensive summary of future episodes. It's just me talking to you about my deepest feelings about Trump, the human being, not the president. Simply put, Donald Trump does not meet the ethical or behavioral standards that I hold for the highest office. And I'm going to spend the next few minutes trying to convince you that these standards should matter to you. My issue with Trump regards the stuff beneath the political layer of his personality. As a liberal, I disagree with Trump's environmental policies and his views on a variety of other matters of state, but those are things that I disagree with Republicans on, not Trump specifically. My expectations of a man's moral decency transcend my politics. To put it another way, if you could imagine an alternate mirror universe where the Democrat version of Donald Trump exists, I would never vote for this person, even though I would probably agree with many of his policies. We're going to talk about that specific point in a later episode, by the way. In the first episode of this podcast, I said that my target audience is Trump supporters, but not members of his core base, and I'd like to explain why that is. The people who make up Trump's base are people who look at Trump and see an admirable, honorable man. I disagree with this perception so fundamentally that I'm not even sure how to begin changing their minds about him. I'm not sure their minds can be changed. But if you think of Trump's supporters as rings of concentric circles, the people I'm trying to convince not to vote for Trump in 2020 are the people in the second ring, a little further out from the base. These people are conservatives and they plan to vote for Trump in 2020, but they agree with me on a few things. They agree that Trump's behavior is unbecoming of a president and that he does not adhere to the social norms of American politics. But they support him anyway because they agree with his policies, not the way he talks. If you are in this second ring of Trump supporters, I ask you to consider Trump's behavior equally important as his policies. I want to talk about a few specific behavioral and personality traits of his, and I'm going to try to pick the traits that I think you and I are most likely to agree on. I honestly don't think any of these are super controversial if they're viewed outside the context of politics, and we'll do an interesting exercise towards the end of this episode. The first negative trait I want to single out is Donald Trump's braggadocio. Trump is a man who speaks hyperbolically about himself any chance he gets. He calls himself the greatest president in modern history. He says his administration has done more for X than any other president ever, where X is literally anyone or anything he feels like talking about at the moment. He repeatedly calls himself a genius over and over on Twitter and in press conferences. Anytime Trump gets the opportunity to reflect upon himself, he says things like, I give myself a perfect score, or I did perfectly, or I am the greatest, or nobody could have done it better, or nobody knows better than me. Could you imagine Barack Obama talking about himself like this? It would be so obvious to you how childish a personality trait this really is. 
Trump is a man with zero humility who has made only one single half-hearted public apology ever. His infamous grab her by the pussy quote. And this apology came just a few months after the March 2016 Republican primary debate in which Trump reassured America on primetime national television that his penis size was adequate. There's a common wisdom about men who brag all the time. They're insecure. They're self-conscious. And if braggadocio is a function of insecurity, Donald Trump is the most insecure person in the American public eye. The second trait related to the first one is Trump's intellectual curiosity. Now, despite what people say, it's pretty hard to evaluate someone's intelligence because not all smart people are capable of expressing their brilliance in sensible ways. There are autistic math geniuses who can't even speak. There are unassuming musical savants like the artist formerly known as Prince who played all 22 instruments on his debut album. There are undercover scientists like the lead singer of the punk band The Offspring, who has a PhD in molecular biology, or the guitarist of Queen, who has a PhD in astrophysics, or the singer of Bad Religion, who has a PhD in zoology and lectures at UCLA and Cornell. There are farmers who people dismiss as hicks, but who are masters of the complicated science of food production. There are authors who can't put two sentences together on a first date, but whose books change people's lives. It's so hard to truly gauge someone's intellect if you aren't seeing the product of their labor. But truly brilliant people busy themselves with their curiosities. They don't simply assure people as often as possible that they are geniuses. They don't pay ghost writers to author biographies about how smart they are. They don't call radio shows pretending to be their own secretary and bragging about how many women they can seduce. And they certainly don't misspell words like hamburger or smoking. But those are the things that Trump does. Rather than let his business empire speak for itself, Trump has to constantly reassure us that he is, in fact, a brilliant businessman, despite the long line of people who've worked with him that tell us otherwise. Even Tony Schwartz, the author of Trump's biography, The Art of the Deal, went public with his confession that Donald Trump has the intellectual capacity of a child. If you're old enough, you may recall President Ronald Reagan, the Jesus Christ of the Republican Party. Reagan's presidential success is widely agreed upon by virtually all conservatives, and yet never once did Reagan see fit to tell us that he was a genius or that he was the best president ever. He was composed, measured, and lucid in all of his speeches. Compare that to Trump, who frequently goes on long-winded, incoherent diatribes about his own perfection. It strikes me, as it should any reasonable person, that Trump is very openly self-conscious about his intelligence. And frankly, he should be, because the more he speaks, the more obvious it is that he is not the genius that he claims to be. His speeches are not fonts of presidential wisdom like those of Abraham Lincoln or Ike Eisenhower. They are the petulant, indignant rantings of an ignoramus who clearly does not read any books at all, ever. Compare this to all of the well-known geniuses of history. Einstein, Hawking, Sagan, Newton, Aristotle, Galileo, Tesla, Pythagoras, Edison, Franklin, Turing. To be fair, Isaac Newton was a spectacular asshole, but he was also spectacularly brilliant, probably the most intelligent person who ever lived. Whereas Trump simply reassures us that he is a genius, Newton left us without a doubt by giving us classical mechanics, calculus, the laws of motion and gravity, and several world-changing discoveries in optical science. And almost 2,000 years before that, Eratosthenes of Cyrene, he, this guy was a Greek genius, he figured out the circumference of the Earth as well as its distance from the sun using a stick. Is Donald Trump really a genius? 
The third trait I think any reasonable person would acknowledge is that Trump has an abusive personality. Let's take a look at this from a wider angle just for a second here. In many other countries, politicians are sometimes known to hurl personal insults at each other. Fistfights have broken out in the parliaments of Ukraine, South Africa, and India. But in the United States, we have a modern tradition of behavioral restraint. In previous election cycles, Romney and Obama and McCain and Bush and Clinton were not hurling personal insults at each other. In fact, John McCain famously defended Barack Obama at one of his own rallies when a woman took the microphone and said Obama was not an American. Presidents before Trump did not shout at reporters. They did not call the press the enemy of the people or the enemy of the state, and they did not advocate violence against protesters. They did not make fun of private citizens. But Trump has foisted all of this upon our political tradition. He calls people his enemies. Enemies. This is not a word that we use in the American political tradition when we are talking about other Americans. It is dangerous to do this. Turning a country upon itself is what evil politicians have done throughout all of history. The reason why our country is so politically stable is because we do not speak about domestic political rivals the same way that European dictators did. Even when he isn't calling them his enemies, Trump comes up with childish nicknames for rivals. He calls people stupid and publicly insults federal judges. He dishonors well-respected military officials and attacks anyone who criticizes him, regardless of whether they're politicians or private citizens. He even calls news anchors, even the ones at Fox News, human garbage. Possibly the worst thing Trump does, however, is to speak hatefully about an entire political party. This is so dangerous, I'm devoting an entire episode to it. Simply put, Donald Trump is, and I mean this about the very core of his being, a fucking jerk. If you need any further evidence that Trump has an abusive personality, do yourself a favor. Google Donald Trump Twitter. Click on his account. It's called Real Donald Trump, all one word. Now open a second browser window and Google Barack Obama Twitter. Scroll through each president's Twitter account for 10 minutes. Look at the frightening content difference between them. One of these Twitter accounts is run by a man that you might disagree with, but who never once insults or threatens people. The other is a literal shrine to the kind of talk 13-year-old boys have on Xbox Live. I'm not trying to convince you to become a fan of Barack Obama. I'm just using him as an example because he's the most recent president before Trump. The behavioral comparison is warranted, and the behavioral contrast is stark. The fourth trait is Trump's dishonesty. Now, a ton of people have accused Donald Trump of being a liar, so much that I think conservatives have really become numb to this accusation. Of course, I think Trump is a liar at the conversational level, but I want to talk about a different, more insidious kind of dishonesty. I'm talking about the effort Trump puts into dog whistling at Christian conservatives, trying to convince them that they are being oppressed and that he is one of them. It's almost impossible for a person who didn't grow up in the Bible Belt to understand just how deeply committed to their spirituality evangelical Christians really are. Down there, religion is not just some old thing our parents grew up with. It is imminent and permeates every level of existence for these people. For a lot of them, Christianity truly forms the core part of their identity. They know their scriptures, they attend church regularly, and they truly are fellows of a Christian community. But the idea that Donald Trump, the boorish, rage-tweeting billionaire, is a devout Christian is nonsense. This is a man who appeared in an adult film paid money to porn stars, spent an entire career publicly bragging about his sex life, and defrauded his own charities and had to pay $2 million in restitution. The notion that this man, 
sits up late at night scrawling thoughtful notes upon the pages of his well-worn personal Bible, pensively reflecting upon its lessons, is nonsense. At Liberty University in January 2016, in front of thousands of Christian students, Trump mispronounced a book of the Bible in such a way as to indicate that he had never referred to a Bible passage in his entire life. And the students laughed at him for it. It was obvious to them right away how often Donald Trump really reads the Bible. On another occasion, he didn't know what Good Friday was, the day of Christ's crucifixion. I think it's perfectly fine for people to practice their faiths in a limited way, and a lot of Christians cannot quote Bible passages, despite the fact that they are true believers. But for all of Trump's fire and brimstone about loving Jesus and defending Christianity, it really seems to me that this is hollow speech for political gain. He knows he needs the evangelical vote, so he lies to Christians about his spirituality. And it works. The fifth and final trait I'd like to discuss is Trump's pettiness, which relates closely to the other four. His private squabbles that spill over into the public eye are so frequent and so asinine that it almost seems like Trump has a pathological commitment to being as petty as a man can be. Anytime someone resigns from his cabinet and raises doubts about his leadership abilities, Trump maligns them as inept or a deep state traitor, or in the case of women, ugly or stupid. When Trump nominated Jeff Sessions as his attorney general, he said Sessions was one of the best people for the job and that he had complete faith in him. A few months later, Trump flip-flopped, calling Jeff Sessions Mr. Magoo, and he called him an idiot, and he called him incompetent. He did this to almost every single outgoing cabinet member who didn't suck up to him on their way out. John Kelly, John Bolton, Michael Cohen, Steve Bannon, Omarosa Newman, Anthony Scaramucci, Rex Tillerson. Trump assured us that he deeply respected and trusted all of these people, only to tell us, psych, just kidding, they're all incompetent fools, as soon as they voiced concerns about his leadership. Trump even sank to the abysmal lowliness of firing Secretary of Defense James Mattis after Mattis publicly announced his resignation and warned the country that Trump had incompatible views on war and democracy. I beseech your fair-mindedness for the following two questions. Which in your view is more likely? That James Mattis a general of the United States Marine Corps and a lifelong member of the American military is secretly a deep state cultist who is trying to destroy America? Or that Donald Trump just flips out on anyone who questions him regardless of their service to this country? And again, which in your view is more likely that all of these lifelong conservative Republicans that have passed through the White House have a secret pact with Democrats to bring down Trump, or that Trump is just a petty, narcissistic man-child? Be fair-minded about these questions. So we've established five important facets of Trump's personality. His braggadocio, ignorance, abusiveness, dishonesty, and pettiness. Now, in order to help you see just how terrible these traits are, I want to apply them in a different context. So let's take Donald Trump out of the White House for this exercise and let's put him in a few personal scenarios. Imagine that you have an infant daughter and you're looking to hire a babysitter. You interview a woman who answers your ad and she tells you she's the greatest babysitter who ever lived. She's perfect at her job, there has never been a better babysitter in modern history, and that she has never made a mistake. Then she goes on a long-winded rant about how there are a lot of people who say she's a terrible babysitter, but all of those people are actually part of a global conspiracy to ruin her babysitting career. Would you feel comfortable leaving your child alone with this woman? 
Imagine that your daughter is now 18 years old, and the 18-year-old version of Donald Trump wants to date her. How do you think he talks about his ex-girlfriends? Judging by how he talks about anyone who abandons him, or anyone who says something negative about him, he probably says all sorts of nasty things about them. Combine this fact with the way that Donald Trump tends to talk about women. This man brags about himself all day, insults people that he perceives as traitors, and loves being confrontational. Would you be comfortable letting someone like this take your daughter out? Would you be comfortable with your daughter marrying this person? Now, imagine that you're a hiring manager and Donald Trump applies for the job. His resume says he's a genius and he will be the greatest employee in history because he was the greatest employee at all his past companies. You get the idea. In any other context, a person with these traits is obviously unstable and untrustworthy. But in politics, people like Donald Trump get a pass because voters are more concerned with defeating their perceived enemies than they are with vetting their own candidates. Let's stick with the employer theme for a bit. I'll call this example the toxic workplace. Imagine that you work at a respectable company in corporate America. The business culture is as professional as anyone could expect. You and your coworkers are treated with a certain level of respect at all times, and in return, you respect your managers. For this exercise, imagine your direct supervisor's name is Andy. Even though you and Andy disagree sometimes, and Andy sometimes annoys you, Andy always treats you and others with integrity. When Andy found out that your coworker was stealing money from the company, he dealt with it professionally. The coworker was removed, and Andy never brought it up again in order to protect the dignity of the business culture. However, one day you come into the office and you discover that Andy has retired, and now your new boss is Donald Trump. The first thing Trump does when he comes into office is accuse a bunch of your coworkers of being phonies who are loyal to Andy because they are liberals. He calls a few of the women skanks and makes comments about their periods and their body types. Instead of dealing with it privately at the executive level, Trump complains in the break room during lunch about the other companies doing business with yours. He calls them leeches. He demands absolute loyalty from you and all of his subordinates, and if anyone disagrees with any of his decisions, or if they take issue with his erratic behavior, he sends company-wide emails containing long-winded rants about that employee, riddled with spelling errors and childish insults. Trump then invents nicknames for other department heads, like Lazy Susan and Jittery Jordan and Weepy Pete. He occasionally walks over to your desk just to assure you that he's a genius, or to tell you how great of a job he has done since he got hired. When you thought it couldn't get any worse, Trump starts firing your coworkers and replacing them with family members and personal friends of his who have never worked in this industry ever. When some of Trump's buddies get in trouble for breaking company rules or for committing actual crimes, Trump says they're being unfairly treated by jealous phonies and that all the new employees are, quote, perfect people. Finally, he begins redirecting money away from partner companies and sends it to small businesses run by his personal friends or people who donated to his daughter's Girl Scouts fundraiser. Slowly, the business culture at your company begins to rot. Coworkers become toxic and overcompetitive, always trying to gain favor with Trump. Meanwhile, Trump sits in his office shooting off angry company-wide emails up to 200 times per day. When the annual employee well-being survey results are published, a majority of employees say they dislike Trump and do not approve of his conduct. Trump immediately fires off a dozen emails saying that the survey is rigged and fake, and everyone he meets in the hallways say that he's wonderful, perfect, genius, and the greatest manager who ever worked there. The standard of conduct has fallen so low that other department heads begin to act however they want. When you finally decide you've had enough and you tender your resignation, 
Trump screams across the office, you can't quit, you're fired. Then he sends another company-wide email telling everyone you were an idiot and the company is better off without you. This is Donald Trump in the Oval Office on his phone with Twitter and at the podium during press conferences. The reason I use the toxic workplace example is because virtually every person in America knows what it's like to have a great boss, and they also know what it's like to have a terrible boss. And in each case, the boss affects the gravity around the entire office. People strongly prefer managers whose conduct is professional rather than petty. This is why you should care about how Trump behaves, not just the effect of his policies. His behavior sets a precedent for future politicians. Donald Trump is teaching senators and representatives and future presidents that it's okay to name call and to throw tantrums and to act like a petulant child. And one day I predict that this will give rise to a Democrat version of Donald Trump, which will be the Republican Party's worst nightmare. This will be so bad I'm devoting an entire episode to the idea in a few weeks. But just imagine a president who is an ill-tempered man-child who shrieks all day long on Twitter about how Fox News is the enemy of the state and how Republicans are trying to overthrow democracy and erect a fascist dictatorship. Imagine the hundred million or so people who would enthusiastically go along with this. If you support Donald Trump, you are paving the way for his little blue clone in a future election, and I'm telling you, you will regret it. Everyone should have a high standard of personal conduct for their coworkers, their managers, and their politicians. Everyone benefits from this model, and that is why all former U.S. presidents, spare a genocidal maniac and a drunkard, agreed to behave as gentlemen in the public eye, and to never stoop to the level of elementary school name-calling, lying, and trash-talking. The real issue here is that Donald Trump's antisocial personality traits must affect his policy decisions and his judgment. It's totally reasonable to assume this, because it's true about most people. What Trump says about people he dislikes, and what he says about himself, is a window into the inner workings of his mind. And if you look through that window, it's plain to see a noisy machine full of redundancies, powered by narcissism, and spewing disgusting smoke into every television set in America. This is not a man who is sound of mind, nor sound of heart, nor sound of personality. He is deeply troubled at the idea of checks on his power and of criticisms of his leadership, however mild or accurate. Donald Trump would rather you believe in a global conspiracy against him than admit when he doesn't know something or when he made a mistake. But most of all, the President of the United States sets the tone of the music of politics, and Donald Trump's tone is basically thrash metal. How politicians interact, how the parties perceive each other, and how the press analyzes political events is all colored by the indignation and the petulance of Trump's attitude. In a word, he makes everything about American politics uglier. That is my problem with Donald Trump. It's not that he is a Republican or that I disagree with his platforms. It's that I disagree with his soul. And I know the long-term consequences, historically, of allowing the highest office to be laid so low. 